Welcome to MOOC course on introduction to proteogenomics. In the course so far, the emphasis was to give you the good understanding of genomics and proteomics, different basic concepts and tools available to do data analysis. But now we will shift gear and move on how to integrate data from both genomics and proteomics in the form of proteogenomics because neither the genomic or proteomic platforms could provide you the complete picture. Protogenomic technologies, protogenomic tools have power to combine various genomic approaches along with proteomic data sets to provide a comprehensive very broad overview at transcriptional and translational level. In today's lecture, Professor David Fenio will introduce you to the basic concepts of proteogenomics. So, let us welcome Dr. Fenio for his lecture. So far you have uh, had first an introduction to genomics, then to proteomics and uh, also to machine learning and uh, now I will try to give uh, an introduction to, to proteogenomics where we combine the genomics and the proteomics and see what uh, additional things we can do when we have uh, both kinds of um, data. So uh, as you heard from uh, Carl, um, when we, we often uh, uh, when we want to, the first step in proteomics is to uh, identify uh, uh, peptides and, and then proteins. And so, uh, one uh, very important thing with, with this database search is that if we, if the protein, the exact protein sequence that we are looking for is not in the database, we will not be able to, uh, to find it. Um, so, uh, so, what one uh, can do then, and of course we know that in, in cancer there are a lot of um, uh, changes in the genome and uh, then these could lead to changes in uh, protein sequence. But if we just use the, the uh, reference protein sequence database, we will not be able to, um, uh, to identify this. Um, but now since we have um, both uh, genomics and proteomics data, we can use uh, the genomics data to, uh, to modify our database, to add in uh, all the uh, effects of the genomic changes. Uh, so, uh, so that's, and then we make a more uh, comprehensive database that then uh, we should be able to see the specific changes that happen in this uh, uh, tumor. And so, uh, for example, just to look at a few examples, if we have um, a single nucleotide change, like in this case here, we have one base that is uh, changing that then can lead to a change in an amino acid. So, this is just one example uh, of in this protein, we have uh, a, uh, on the, in the DNA, we observe that the G at position 183 changes to an A, uh, which then leads to that this uh, valine at position 62 in the reference database changes to an isoleucine. So, the, the triptych peptide is underlined where we have the, uh, the valine. So, the change uh, we see is uh, that uh, uh, we then instead uh, get a, a modified peptide that then will have a different mass and a different uh, fragmentation spectrum. Uh, so, uh, so what we, uh, but if we go through and take all the single nucleotide variants um, that we see in the genome and uh, see which extra uh, triplet peptides we get, we can then make uh, a larger uh, database. Um, so, this is probably the simplest uh, change. Um, on the genomic level that then propagates to the proteome. Uh, we can have more uh, complex changes. So, for example, in this case, we have a more dramatic change where this on the, geno in the DNA, this C at position 155 changes to an A and that means that the tyrosine changes to a stop codon. So, uh, what will happen then is that 
most of the uh, protein will uh, um, not uh, uh, able to be produced in our sample uh, in, the, in the tumor. So we see we can only expect to see peptides from the uh, first part. Um, so of course this is much more uh, difficult case in the sense that um, we in proteomics our coverage is limited so if we don't see something that's uh, 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 not a proof that it's not there so uh, but uh, uh, but that's uh, uh, one example of things that can change and so uh, what uh, people do then is to sort of evaluate all the possible uh, effects that we can have and and Kelly is going to talk more about uh, what kind of changes uh, uh, are, but I'll just quickly say that most of the different ones are related to uh, that uh, splice variants that we can get uh, on the, uh, from the RNA sequencing. So uh, this one up here is just simply that we have uh, three exons and uh, according to reference database exon 1 is connected to 2 which is connected to 3. But then in the RNA-seq we also see that exon 1 is connected directly to exon 3. Um, so uh, uh, that's, uh, uh, but we also see a lot of other cases where uh, we get connections from the middle of an exon, from an intron and so on. And so Kelly is going to talk more in detail about uh, these things, what, uh, uh, what you can expect and how to um, create these uh, tumor specific databases using combination of uh, um, usually exome sequencing uh, where we get the variants and uh, insertion solutions and uh, the RNA-seq where we get uh, the different uh, splice variants. So, uh, so what are the effects then uh, that we, we see from uh, these genomic changes? So uh, it can be the protein sequence can change as we looked at these two examples. Uh, we can also uh, have that the modification site is changing. Um, and, but we can also in a lot of cases have a mutation that doesn't change the protein sequence but changes its uh, level. So it's either uh, from a mutation you get more of the protein or, or less. Um, and uh, the same for uh, modifications, that uh, uh, mutations can lead to both increasing and decreasing uh, of the mutations. Uh, so I have a question, so why, why do we care? Why, what do we use these? So now we make a big catalog of uh, uh, modifications that we see on the genomic level and that we also see on the proteomic level. So, Anyone have any suggestions for what, uh, what, why, what do we do after that, after we made this uh, catalog? No? Yeah? Like if you have that catalog, then we can, uh, when we test our sample data set, and if you can find them at variants, and we can cross check the vector catalog, whether this variant is specific to cancer or not. Yes, so we can uh, look downstream and see if this, um, it, I mean both that it's correlated with cancer or that maybe it happens in a, a tumor suppressor gene or an oncogene that um, uh, changes things, yes. Um, and another thing that we can uh, of course look at is uh, if these uh, peptides are only present in cancer and not in normal samples. Um, then we can uh, try to target them and uh, uh, see if that uh, uh, we can, for example, act, try to activate the immune system to um, attack cells that uh, display these uh, peptides or, uh, uh, or in other ways do targeting. And there are examples of uh, um, uh, treatments like that already. Or we can also use this uh, as a catalog to create a database which we can use for programming mass fit search Yes, no, so that's what we do, yeah, so, no, but it's, I was thinking of after that, after we've done the, yeah. So my question is, sir, as you were saying, so do you mean like a peptide specific to cancer or something like that? Yeah, or do you mean like a peptide specific to cancer or something like that? 
Yes, that's what I was thinking. So I, two ways. So either peptide specific to uh, uh, the tumor or uh, that uh, a protein is activated that's usually not uh, uh, active that is uh, maybe not expressed at all in most uh, cells but gets because of mutations gets expressed. So that's another thing that we can talk. So for example in breast cancer um, HER2 would be an example of that. In most cells we have very low amounts but uh, in a subtype of um, uh, uh, breast tumors we have it uh, it's very highly expressed on the surface. Uh, of, uh, uh, of the cancer cells, so we can then uh, target, uh, have targeted treatment for that. But we are doing the mass spec analysis, so we are getting a list of peptides. So, uh, like uh, if we are saying this is cancer specific, but that protein is also there with a normal sample also. So, I, like, sorry, Ma, I don't know, but uh, how we can say. I mean, yeah, so that depends on your experimental design. So if you, uh, for example, you'll uh, have to then analyze a lot of um, uh, 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 tumors and also uh, normal samples to see that uh, in most of the normal samples you don't see it. Um, and I mean, uh, prefer, I mean, what one can do is, for example, look at uh, studies like uh, GTEx that uh, um, looks at a lot of normal uh, uh, samples because if, if for a good treatment you want uh, that there is no expression in, uh, in any of the organs pretty much. And you can, so you can use these public data sets to compare. Another thing that we can do is to uh, go back to the uh, central dogma of the molecular biology since we now are measuring these different kinds uh, of molecules. So we, we are uh, doing whole genome sequencing, we have RNA-seq data, uh, we measure um, uh, how, uh, the protein levels and we measure uh, how uh, much modifications we have. Um, so that's in, in CPTAC, that's what we, we usually do. In, in some time, for some projects we have other types of measurements, but these at least basic measurements that we have. So we can look a little bit at what, how these relationships uh, are. So uh, for one, as uh, was already mentioned several times, uh, that the I mean, the proteins and the modifications are the functional gene products. So that's what uh, uh, makes the phenotype. Um, but uh, then, of course, it's uh, much easier to measure uh, DNA and RNA. There are much more uh, automated methods and uh, uh, that still, even though there's been a lot of improvement, it's still rather uh, uh, much more difficult to measure uh, proteins and, uh, uh, and modified proteins. Um, so, uh, so it's often, one can probably uh, have, in most studies where one only looks at, for example, RNA-seq uh, of tumors, uh, these are many more samples um, are analyzed. Um, but um, the, um, so then the question is, Okay, so it's cheaper and faster to measure RNA. Can we just uh, measure RNA instead and uh, not worry about the, uh, the proteins and their modifications? So there are many arguments for why um, that's not a good idea. Um, I mean, first of all, there's a lot of additional regulation than uh, this. The other thing is that uh, this process, uh, the transcription and translation uh, is rather slow, but the modifications can be done uh, uh, both added and removed very fast. And then we have uh, different degradation rates, usually for RNA and proteins. So we shouldn't be surprised that there are uh, substantial differences between uh, RNA uh, and uh, uh, protein measurements. So uh, if we just look at one example. So this is um, in breast cancer. It's uh, ERBB2. So we look here. We have uh, copy number, 
and uh, uh, RNA levels. So we see that uh, there are, is a group uh, of samples that have a higher copy number of this gene uh, over B2. And of course this is the uh, HER2 uh, subtype and we see that that's correlated with uh, uh, transcript levels. So we have more copies of the gene, we, have, we will have more RNA. So we have uh, a nice uh, correlation there. So if we go down and look at the translation, uh, we see that also RNA is correlated with the protein here. So when we have uh, uh, many transcripts, we also have more protein. Um, and finally, if we look at one of the uh, phosphorylation sites, um, it's also very highly correlated with uh, the protein levels. Um, so that's what we, at, uh, if there is no, addition, no uh, additional regulation, that's what we would expect. So we have more copies of the gene, we get more transcripts and more proteins. But if you look in the same gene in this example in another tumor type, so in ovarian cancer, uh, we first of all, we don't have um, really any uh, uh, copy number changes. All the samples have the same copy number. They pretty much have the same uh, uh, transcript levels also. Um, and, but even though there is the same transcript level, we see quite a range of variation of the protein. Um, and uh, almost, uh, it's a little bit smaller than the range of proteins uh, in uh, uh, breast cancer, but it's definitely very comparable. And uh, finally, we don't see any correlation between protein uh, and the same phosphopeptide as we see, so very strong correlation here. So th these are uh, observations that we see and we can look at different genes and uh, we see large uh, differences in, uh, uh, between different tumor types, between different uh, subtypes. Just to look at one more example, uh, this is uh, one of the keratins. So here we don't have any, so we're looking at breast cancer, ovarian cancer and colon cancer and we don't see any changes in copy number in any of uh, the tumors. Uh, we see, but we see very large range, uh, difference in range of the RNA levels. So in breast cancer we have a very large range, uh, in ovarian cancer almost no uh, change in transcript levels and in uh, colon cancer somewhere uh, in between. Um, then if you look at comparing, uh, looking at the translation, so between RNA and protein, breast cancer again we see correlation uh, and in, uh, we see some correlation but it's, the range of RNA is very small for ovarian cancer and uh, even though we have quite a bit of variation of the transcript levels, there is no, uh, the, the protein levels are constant. Um, so we see that in this case we have very different regulation of both the transcript and the protein. And so if we look uh, so these are just two examples. So now if we look uh, more globally, we see that uh, there is a wide range of, so this is copy number transcript. We see that there are some that are highly correlated, others are there's a, uh, even anti-correlated uh, and we see this wide range. And for every comparison, both uh, transcript uh, protein and uh, protein phosphoprotein. So, um, so then, so what does it mean now? So we see, if we see a correlation in one case, we don't see a correlation, what do we, how do we start thinking about this? Any suggestions? Maybe we can start, let's say, what do we say if we uh, uh, see a correlation, what, any, yeah, anyone? So the reason can be uh, the DNA is uh, not to transcribe into uh, RNA or, or some part of the DNA is not to transcribe into RNA and the RNA is not, uh, might be the RNA is translated into protein. Some of the protein has been degraded and some of them is a uh, yeah. transport process. Yes. So, and we can also have a case where uh, the, the proteins are produced somewhere else in the body, like there, we'll also see a lot of blood proteins 
that will be in the tumor, but there is no RNA there because it, it's being produced somewhere else. So, there are of all these things and we have the degradation, so we have uh, a lot of different um, uh, things going on. Ribosic acid proxy for translation? Yes, we can, uh, that's, uh, so yeah, so ribosic would be uh, somewhere uh, in between here, it would measure uh, the actual translation. It wouldn't measure the, the, the amount of protein that's uh, there, but it would measure how much is um, actually translated at the moment. So that, yeah, that's definitely, that would be going one in, a step in between the RNA and the protein. In today's lecture, you got a very broad detailed glimpse of how proteogenomics could help to reduce changes in protein sequences due to the mutations in the gene, how to identify the changes in modification sites of proteins, also in which way proteogenomics could help to understand the changes in the level of protein expression due to change in the gene sequences. In diseases, which are characterized by the changes in the protein sequence due to mutations at the genetic level, the protogenomic analysis could help to provide us the development of disease specific databases where the modified protein sequence information could be made available. Taking the example of ERBB2 and using protogenomics, Dr. Fenu showed that there exists a clear correlation between RNA protein and phosphoprotein expression in breast cancer. However, same did not hold true for ovarian cancer cases as there was only correlation between RNA and protein, but not the phosphoprotein levels. So, you can see that you know there is no clear pattern depending on each disease a specific context, the correlations could actually vary and therefore, these analysis on individual data set by looking at a specific questions are very relevant. Though protogenomic studies may not always show a direct correlation at all the levels, they still offer and provide information which could be used to answer questions which are very relevant to disease pathobiology. In the next lecture, you will be introduced to few more concepts of protogenomics in clinical studies by Dr. David Fanu. Thank you.